Good morning, everyone. Welcome for, for all of you to be here. This side event is entitled Public and Private Sustainability Initiatives in and Beyond. Uh, I have to unmute myself, is that right? No? Right. Uh, in and Beyond Supply Chains to Promote Greater Inclusion of Smallholders and Small and Medium Enterprises. Um, Right, I'm trying to find, yes. So I will start with some brief introductory remarks um, before we go into four different case studies uh, that will be presented by Michael, myself, and two CIRAD colleagues who have pre-recorded their presentations because they were unable to come to the World Forestry Congress. These introductory remarks are based on a study that was published last year uh, as an FTA working paper number eight that had done an assessment of a broad array of different sustainability initiatives. And I think in terms of the framing this session, I think we are all aware that there has been continued growth of agricultural commodities in terms of both domestic and global trade. And I think it's important to stress both those elements of the growth in trade. And this has led to multiple social and environmental challenges. In addition, during a similar period, we've seen improved access to information and many new multi-stakeholder initiatives since the adoption of the post-2030 agenda, notably with reference to Sustainable Development Goals 1716 and 1717, which all relate to the framework for means for imp implementation. And this in itself has led to greater scrutiny, particularly for some commodities. And I could cite, for example, soy in the Cerrado in Brazil, palm oil in Indonesia, amongst other commodities. We've also seen over the last 20 years, a plethora of sustainability initiatives. And here I refer to three recent studies. Uh, one, a summary of 10 years of experience of C4's work on value chains, finance and investments, uh, led by Michael. Another study, the FTA working paper I refer to. And April this year, the International Institute for Sustainable Development published another study which was reviewing sustainability initiatives, particularly in relation to reducing financial risk. So we've seen a very diverse array of instruments and tools to promote deforestation-free sourcing as a way of reducing exposure to reputational, financial, and regulatory risks, but very often there's little articulation between them. These instruments include a number of voluntary sustainability standards, as well as many private governance regulations, which have encompassed, amongst others, codes of conduct, principles and guidelines, and moratoria. More recently, we've seen the adoption of both public and private commitments to zero deforestation. However, you're probably also aware that the last Forest 500 report indicated that no palm oil, soy, cattle, or timber company had met the goal of eliminating deforestation from their supply chains by 2020. In addition, the recent IISD report has highlighted an estimated $260 billion investment deficit in agriculture if we are to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 2 and reducing poverty. So this panel explores some of the many challenges to implementing public and private sustainability initiatives. It's based on four case studies of forests Trees and Agroforestry, the consortium research program that was coordinated by C4 for the last 10 years. And I will stop here and introduce my colleague, Michael Brady, who will start with the first of the four case studies, which relates to FSC. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, you've got to... I've got to go out. Go out. Stop share. So... Okay. Well, hello to all. Uh, uh, thank you for coming uh, this early in the morning. Uh, I guess many of our online participants in, uh, in Europe and Latin America may not be uh, joining us this, at this time of day. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm... can you hear me? You're on mute. 
you still mute? Yes, me? yes, Michael, we can hear you clearly. Okay, I'm not. Oh, I can hear an echo. I think I've got to get out and mute myself and go back you in. There we go. Okay, well, I, as the, the first speaker, I'm going to be talking about a uh, exercise that uh, I've uh, been part of over the last three years in developing a smallholder uh, standard uh, with FSC. Just acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Lloyd Jones and Keith Moore. Page down. There we go. Yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the Forest Stewardship Council uh, who has uh, supported this activity. The technical advisory group uh, members of the uh, smallholder standard uh, from India, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam, and all of the smallholder farmers that we engaged with in, in those four countries. Uh, colleagues at C4 ICRAF <coughs> and uh, our, our hosts here at the World Forestry Congress. <coughs> so I think we're all um, well aware of the constraints to smallholder certification. Um, millions of, of smallholders in the Asia Pacific region uh, would benefit from certification either through access, better access to markets uh, some in some cases price premiums through certification, but these smallholders um, are constrained by by scale, typically one <coughs> to five hectares of land uh, in which they manage. Uh, these are typically single management units. Basic education levels are also a constraint where smallholders may not fully understand uh, certification systems and many of the, the processes involved uh, in those systems. Uh, affordability is another constraint where uh, incomes for smallholders are typically very limited. Uh, so they can't afford either the initial certification uh, process or the ongoing uh, audit, uh, maintenance audits required. So many, many constraints and uh, this has been, well known, uh, we have some examples where smallholders have been certified and have actually had to give it up because of affordability uh, and lack of uh, you know, issues around premium, price premium and market access. I was uh, worked in Laos in the last few years where a uh, teak program in Luang Prabang uh, unfortunately gave up, uh, gave up their FSC uh, certification after after about 10 years. So FSC uh, recognized these constraints, uh, recognized that the, uh, you know, the FSC FM uh, forest management certification was not a, not entirely um, achievable for smallholders. Uh, there is a group certification, but not all smallholders are, are, are uh, able to form these groups. And um, um, so a, a program started, um, the New Approaches Project uh, by FSC. And I list here a number of initiatives under the New Approaches Project. And the, the last bullet refers to what I'm talking to you today about, which is the Asia Pacific Regional Forest Stewardship Standard, or the RFSS. Uh, for smallholders. So I'll, I'll refer to this as the smallholder standard. Uh, there's a more recent initiative by FSC, again, uh, at the community level. This is the Community and Family Forest Program, again, focusing on the forest management group standard. So the purpose of the uh, smallholder standard development is, is to provide a realistic, achievable 
uh, system of indicators relevant to the circumstances of smallholders for their management units in the Asia Pacific region. So this is not a, a global standard. It's an initial uh, focus on four countries in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, and the focus is on uh, smallholder operations, uh, aiming to be realistic and uh, having achievable indicators relevant to the circumstances of smallholders and their management units. Uh, it was, it's been uh, designed to use simple language that can be met, uh, understood and met by smallholders. <coughs> um, and the intention was to address the realities of over uh, 500 million smallholders uh, in these four countries. So a group was uh, assembled back in 2019 under the policy and standards manager of uh, FSC Asia Pacific. And we had um, a chamber balance technical advisory group. So I think you're, uh, you may be aware of the, the way FSC is organized in its three um, environment, social and economic chambers. So we had representatives from the four countries from each of the three chambers. So a, a, a nicely balanced team and this technical advisory group, uh, I, I was the, the chair, technical advisor, and then my two colleagues uh, acted as a policy manager and a standard drafter. A little bit of the timeline for the, the development of, of this new standard. Uh, as I said, we commenced in 2019, uh, initially drafted a standard and then perform two field tests in the four countries. Uh, so the revised standard um, was developed by 2020 and uh, public consultations were held in April to July of 2020. Came up with a, a final draft incorporating the results of the field tests, public uh, consultations, and interactions, intense interactions with the, um, the performance and standards units within, uh, within FSC. And this was submitted for approval uh, in December of 2020. Uh, conditions were addressed and resubmitted in 2021. And by July of 2021, the FSC board approved the new standard for testing as a pilot based on the FSC policy for pilot testing. And I'll, I'll go through uh, some of the features of the standard and the, and the next steps in this pilot testing. So the, uh, the intention or the scope for this new smallholder standard was that it would be applicable for all smallholders who own or manage individual units, the focus on plantations, woodlots, orchards, or agroforestry in, in a number of configurations from block, linear, or strip forms, um, all being less than 20 hectares in size. So the, the key uh, criteria here is, is 20 hectares, which I, I think many of you know, 100 hectares is, is the uh, limit for, for group, group certification. Uh, it includes uh, boundary trees or small groups of trees. Uh, smallholder groups include community producers, including indigenous or others who fulfill the criteria for small size. Also includes cooperatives, communities, which own, manage, and use forests. Again, uh, on this 20 hectare uh, limit for each uh, family or member. Um, the uh, NTFP, uh, non-timber forest products, uh, are also included in the smallholder standard. It does not apply to natural forests uh, owned by smallholders. Uh, in some countries, uh, natural forest management is, uh, is common for smallholders. In other countries, it's, uh, it's not yet common. I'm thinking of Indonesia, where, where smallholder natural forest management is just starting to emerge and, and be recognized formally. And uh, it does not include short rotation agricultural crops. 
uh, which, which is a challenge because many smallholders have both forestry <clears throat> holdings as well as agricultural crops. So the, the, the big challenge for uh, developing this new standard was to uh, adhere to the 10 FSC principles and uh, 70 criteria, which are all uh, part of the, the formal FSC system. Uh, so we, we had to take, you know, you, uh, use the FSC uh, principles and criteria, but modify those for uh, use by smallholders. We, uh, we did um, maintain the 10 principles. We did identify seven criteria, uh, which we really considered inapplicable to smallholders. And so no indicators were, were developed. And I'll, I'll mention these later. Scale intensity and risk uh, do not appear. It, it is a common concept uh, throughout FSC, but we didn't find that it was uh, applicable to smallholder um, uh, forest holdings. And so it doesn't appear in any of the indicators in the smallholder standard, but it's implied throughout. I mentioned uh, forest testing. Once we uh, developed the initial draft of the standard, uh, we went through a series of tests in, in the four countries. Um, um, the testing was to, to test out the clarity of the indicators uh, that we had developed, the auditability of those indicators. Uh, so working with a number of, um, of uh, CBs, to, to get their views on, on how well these new uh, indicators could be audited. And the utility of guidance material that was prepared as part of the standard and a broad, the broad apl applicability of the new standard for smallholders. Some of the, just some uh, examples, the, uh, we did forest testing in India um, again, in, in uh, this was in a particular eucalyptus plantation being used for pulpwood. Uh, I won't go through these in detail, but just to give you a flavor of, uh, of the testing activities. In Indonesia, we, um, that was a very interesting small holding. Uh, the company that uh, engages with smallholders, um, harvesting a, a natural species for use in pencil production. And they, this company uh, actually does have FSC certification. Uh, the interest was to uh, allow the smallholders to, um, to basically evolve from a company sponsored certification to managing certification on, on their own. Uh, this is a, a rubber, um, a, a mix of rubber and this natural species um, for use for pencil. So it was a combination of, of rubber wood and, um, and the, the particular species for pencil production. And these pencils are, uh, uh, are produced in Indonesia, but sold in uh, Europe, North America. Um, and so FSC certification was is a, a very important part of the, the product. Uh, we had a test in Thailand. Um, which was in, uh, really the, the, the unique feature here was the rubber, was rubber farmers uh, who were, uh, had, I wouldn't say hobby farms, but these farmers also had many other economic activities. So their, their uh, tree plantations were, were one of, of several activities. Uh, these were very much family owned, uh, producing high, very high quality latex, uh, also, some interesting features in Thailand of practicing um, rubber agroforestry. So these were all aspects that we were able to evaluate the smallholder standard against. Finally, and uh, the last was in Vietnam. Again, another uh, example of uh, uh, of smallholders and who already have uh, FSC group certification, and the idea was to test whether these uh, smallholders could in fact, get, uh, achieve FSC certification on their own. And here the, the focus was on acacia plantations. 
Well, some of the challenges that we um, uh, encountered uh, in the process, uh, largely definitional issues, challenge of defining smallholders as, as I've previously described, um, very different from um, you know, typical um, forest um, you know, enterprise companies that have employees. And in, in these cases, smallholders were, were mainly family uh, individuals and families, uh, relatives with, with no, typically no formal employees. Um, smallholder forest and defining what we mean by smallholder forest was also a big challenge. I've, I've mentioned um, of the inclusion of woodlots, plantations, tree farms, uh, but, but often these um, uh, tree farmers have other agricultural activities that are often mixed with their, uh, with their tree plantations. And so trying to separate and certify the, uh, the, the trees uh, from agricultural crops was, was a challenge, particularly on things, for example, uh, use of pesticides, fertilizers, which are quite, quite strongly regulated within FSC. Uh, but for agricultural crops, uh, we, we decided that the standard had to, to basically separate those out. So a farmer could be using fertilizer for agricultural crops, but not for, for tree crops. <coughs> um, so I, I mentioned the principles and criteria. We, uh, we, we incorporated all of the, the um, principles but just a portion of um, the indicators that, that are um, you know, that have been developed by FSC, you can see just a, a, a portion of the indicators were used in the standard. Many were, were found to be just not applicable to, to the smallholder situation. I won't go through this in detail, but just uh, to give you a flavor of the uh, the type of, uh, of conversion from a generic indicator to a smallholder standard indicator. Uh, if we look at say principle 10 at the bottom on uh, implement, implementation of management activities, uh, the language in the, in the generic indicator, this 10.1.1 um, is fairly sophisticated. Uh, using, uh, referring to environmental values, um, uh, referring to pre-harvest or natural forest composition and structure. Uh, smallholders obviously have challenges uh, understanding and applying some of the, the concepts in the indicator. So we, we simplified um, um, almost all of the indicators to, uh, to, you know, for, for smallholders to be able to better, better understand and uh, apply these. So in 10.1.1 in under the smallholder standard indicator, we refer to smallholders as, as promptly replanting or regrowing trees on harvested sites. So a, a much, much more simple language, but just a, a flavor of some of the, the sort of uh, conversion. So the standard, uh, uh, is, is developed. Um, it is online. It, uh, I've listed the, uh, the contents of the smallholder standard. And uh, just to note that it does not include uh, annexes, uh, which are, are generally quite, quite uh, technically complex documents. Uh, and we didn't feel that these were uh, needed or, or appropriate for the stand for smallholders. So this is the standard. And it was um, uh, uh, drafted, as I mentioned earlier, 2021. It was approved uh, in um, just uh, this earlier this year, January 2022. And I've, I've got the website where, where the standard can be accessed. So the next step, uh, now that the, the regional standard is, has been, uh, been developed and approved, is to uh, develop national um, uh, smallholder standards. And this is a, uh, an image of the national standard developed for Indonesia 
for pilot testing. So this is, um, this is uh, brand new and it will be effective in July, 2022 and, and tested in Indonesia by the, the uh, Indonesia national FSC um, uh, groups. Uh, sorry, just to go back, um, a uh, draft has uh, is also been prepared for Vietnam, their uh, national uh, smallholder standard. And the intention <clears throat> is to uh, develop uh, national standards also for India and Thailand, but a, a date hasn't been set. So some concluding uh, comments. <clears throat> Uh, we uh, were able to develop the standard and retain all of the FSC principles and criteria, but uh, translate these into language um, understandable by smallholders. Uh, it does apply just to plantations, which you know, for most smallholders uh, are dealing with plantation forestry. Uh, there's some key innovations. Uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, how the indicators apply to the smallholder makeup. So, so family members, uh, temporary workers, uh, and others who work in the smallholder forest. And the, the use of external bodies to support smallholders uh, where you know, smallholders typically are not capable to do detailed assessments, uh, environmental impact studies, high conservation value assessments. And so the standard uh, provides an opportunity for smallholders to make use of external bodies. Uh, some challenges, uh, I mentioned earlier, the issue of 20 hectares. Uh, the smallholder is, is responsible for, for his, his or her smallholding, but we had to deal with um, conditions just outside or in the vicinity of the small holding versus the small holders location. So to what degree would, would the small holder be responsible for managing uh, say natural forest <laughs> adjacent to a small holding? And that, that was quite a challenge, uh, but it's, it's reasonably well defined in the standard um, using this concept of an immediate vicinity. Uh, the stand holder, um, is uh, you know, it was challenged as I mentioned earlier by this issue of, of uh, com combining forestry, um, uh, wood management, t you know, timber management versus agriculture, often uh, occurring in the same location. Um, and finally, um, the, one of the big challenges now is to expand this uh, smallholder standard beyond the four countries. Uh, and we, we, we certainly hope that, uh, that it will be expanded to other countries and continents where, uh, where there are smallholders. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. I, can, I can try and get. To out with a few words on, on the context of cocoa producing in Central Africa and mainly in Cameroon. So there are a few events to be aware of. First, that there have been a historic, historical decrease of uh, the cocoa support to cocoa producers for almost 25 years, uh, following the structural <laughs> adjustment events. Um, in the state, not uh, increased support uh, cocoa producers in Cameroon for a few dozen of years. Uh, there are also domestic. There are also domestic challenges. The first one is a political upset in the South Tree region. Um, that have been the main. Uh, Sorry, there's a problem about sharing the screen, but also sharing the audio, which is what we're trying to get the two in place. It's this. It starts here. But the, it starts here. Why don't we move on? And Share sound. It's on. It's already on share sound, so it should work. We all tested this before. Uh, thousand of tons. Anyway. anyway. Um, in in that is less than half of the expectation that were um, written in 2014 in uh, the Cocoa Development Plan. Uh, there are also two international changes. That is, uh, the first one is a drop of the um, uh, cocoa price for three years, international price. 
Um, but what is most interesting for, for us is uh, the new pressure that is... Uh, So to start with, uh, a few words on, on the context of cocoa producing in Central Africa and mainly in Cameroon. So there are a few events to be aware of. First, that there have been a historic, historical decrease of uh, the cocoa support to cocoa producers for almost 25 years uh, following the structural adjustment plans. Um, that means that the state uh, doesn't really support uh, cocoa producers in Cameroon for a few dozen of years. Uh, there are also domestic. There are also domestic challenges. The first one, the political upset in the southwest region, um, that have been the main uh, production uh, area for almost twenty years in Cameroon, and this uh, upset has been going for almost three years, and we don't really see the end of this uh, stability. So it has reduced a lot uh, cocoa production over the last years. Uh, as a result, there is a stable production level. Uh, for a few years, that is about now uh, 240,000 uh, of tons um, in, in Cameroon. That is less than half of the expectation that were um, written in 2014 in uh, the Cocoa Development Plan. Uh, there are also a few international challenges. That is, uh, the first one is a drop of the uh, cocoa price for three years, international price. Um, but what is most interesting for, for us is uh, the new pressure that is uh, uh, exerted by uh, European countries and European uh, commissions in favor of sustainable, organic, or deforestation-free cocoa. And uh, as a result in Cameroon, we have seen a strong rise in, uh, in rainforest silencified uh, cocoa. Uh, since in 2016, there, were only, there was only about 3% of the cocoa that was certified by UTZ or um, RA, and it's now about uh, 25%. Pardon? Sorry. Il faut faire quoi? Well, okay, then, then do it. Do the next one. Okay. My presentation will therefore try to analyze how this new challenge have an impact on, on the cocoa community chain in Cameroon. It will be it is divided in two in two parts. The first part we we'll try to describe what is the current state of the community state in, in Cameroon and how um, this chain has been uh, has, has changed following this, uh, this long, medium and short term changes. Uh, especially we'll have a look at the, the places of cooperative in trading cocoa in Cameroon versus informal transaction. We'll also have a look at the support by the public essential services to cocoa farmers. Um, yeah, we'll study what is the role of multinationals ears today in Cameroon and how what is the influence of private certification. And uh, finally, we're going to try to discuss contribution of small, medium and large cap producers. In the second part of this, um, in this presentation, we're going to focus on uh, the influence of certification process, especially the Rainforest Alliance standard on the livelihood of all the farmers. To this purpose, we're going to distinguish between three different kinds of uh, smallholder cocoa farmers. Um, first, we'll consider the non-certified small producers uh, that are in the forest area, basically the southern part of the country. Uh, second, we'll distinguish the producers uh, who uh, grow cocoa in shade agroforest and we are today involved in, in a certification process. And finally, we consider 
some farmers were based in Graceland areas, especially in the Mbam region north of Yande, and we are also involved in, in certification. We have used um, a couple of uh, different methods to, to do this analysis. Uh, first of all, we started with a review of uh, scientific and, and technical literature on, on cocoa growing in, in Cameroon and all the challenges around this, uh, this chain. Uh, but we mainly actually rely on, on individual interviews. We, we did with uh, 63 cocoa farmers who are based in the four main producing regions in, in Cameroon, basically the center region region, um, littoral region, and, and South Sweet region, as it is shown on the map. Um, we selected the respondent according to a four steps process. Uh, we uh, first started to discuss with Rainforest Alliance, and uh, they indicated us uh, a few cooperatives who are today involved in certification. We did the same kind of consultation with the National Cocoa and Coffee Boards to identify the few cooperatives that are not involved in any certification process today. Uh, we went to the headquarters of this cooperative to have a kind of uh, focus group meeting, discussing with all the members, the representatives of, of the cooperative and so on. And finally, we uh, randomly selected uh, a few producers and uh, we ran we ran uh, individual interview with those people, especially to calculate and, and to establish our operating accounts. Uh, as a whole, uh, within the temple, we had, we had um, 67 producers who had joined the Rainforest Alliance certification and 26 uh, who had no business links with any certification schemes. On the basis of the surveys we uh, did with the uh, cocoa producers, but also uh, on the basis of many interviews we had with uh, other stakeholders of the community chains, we have been able to draw this diagram of uh, the structure of the cocoa value chain in Cameroon. So a few lessons may be drawn from this diagram. First, um, out of a vo total volume of uh, 240,000 tons a year uh, of of cocoa, most of it is still exported as, as unprocessed cocoa, uh, with more more than half of the total production that is exported as as, as bulk. Um, another lesson we, is, is about um, the percentage of um, the certified beans, that is almost one third, no, not even one third, but one quarter of the total production, about um, 55,000 tons a year that is exported as, as certified cocoa. And finally, we may uh, see the strong role that is still played by the middlemen uh, in this chain as they uh, trade more than half, uh, even almost two thirds of the total um, production of, of cocoa in Cameroon. We also notice Uh, what we also certification, especially with the Rainforest uh, Alliance scheme, is, is a gaining is gaining momentum. Um, both Telcar and, and Olam are, 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 are putting certification in place uh, today, and it is uh, extending, expanding. And uh, it is today the only the only systems that can trace uh, the origin of the beans, uh, especially with a mass balance traceability system.
So the main So the main result from that that came out from these surveys are presented in this table. Um, well, we clearly see small scale production as uh, the average surface of cocoa plantation is between uh, one and a half hectare uh, to three hectares uh, for the three uh, kind of uh, producers. The yields still uh, quite are still quite low, uh, less than than uh, six. Uh, 100 kilos maximum, and uh, the value added has been also calculated, and uh, it is not that bad. And it mainly mainly came from came from um, from the payment of of manpower. Uh, that's the main source of value added for small scale orders. And uh, what is most interesting is the net profit rate. We clearly why well, it's quite low for the. Uh, cocoa producers that do not who do not benefit from certification support, it's much higher for the two of the kinds of producers between 15 and 24 uh, percent. That clearly indicates uh, an influence of uh, certification on on the monies those people get from cocoa production. So uh, cocoa certification appears as an effective but only a partial solution in Cameroon. Um, on the one hand, uh, cocoa certification concerns today a quarter of the national production and uh, it involves uh, about 90,000 uh, cocoa producers. Um, we also uh, discovered that there is a, a positive correlation between the average profit level of a cocoa grower and his involvement in, in a certification process. So one of the conclusions is that certification schemes uh, now has largely, have largely supplement public services, which are today uh, almost non-effective on the field because of a lack of means to operate. So one of the conclusions is that private certification has become the main support of, of mechanism for small orders. And, and it is difficult to consider certification only as a complementary approach to publication. That's today the main uh, influencing uh, leverage of action to touch um, small order cocoa producers. But on the other hand, I mean, uh, almost 200,000 farmers, cocoa farmers, do not today benefit from these market driven mechanisms uh, for several reasons. First is the age of the plantations, uh, the, small, the small size of plantations or isolation, and also the limited material resources. Um, we, we, we saw that the price today that is proposed and the premium that is associated with certification is too low to convince farmers to invest in improving the, the, the production methods. This is the last slide. So what are the main lessons we may draw from this result? The first one is that uh, it seems to uh, there is a, a strong influence of uh, certification process being involved in certification on uh, the net profit done by the small scale producers. Uh, why is this? The first reason is that uh, there is a higher price that is given to um, to producers that are uh, engaged in certification. Uh, this difference is uh, the bonus is about fifty thousand, fifty thousand francs CFA per. Uh, kilos, uh, so that makes a difference on the on the turnover. But there is also a difference that comes from uh, the cost, and uh, and and the cost is reduced. Uh, the producing cost is reduced when uh, certification happens, especially because there are some subsidies that are provided to um, to producers in terms of training equipment and inputs. And uh, these cities decrease the the cost and then uh, uh, increase uh, the, the profit. Um, what what we also observe is that the state is almost absent now in supporting uh, small scale producers in Cameroon, in rural areas, and uh, most of what are now provided by um, companies that are engaged in certifications. Uh, that means if uh, uh, if any commitment uh, for legality, uh, sustainability of zero deforestation of cocoa production is to be uh, met in the coming years, we have to do it 
uh, with an involvement of the private sectors uh, that has a, the most active uh, stakeholders with uh, small scale uh, cocoa produ producer, producers. But um, certification, the rainforest utilization has still some, some major shortcomings in terms of traceability. It's almost, diff well, almost impossible to attract dry beans from the final market to the, um, the plantations. And there is also a risk to create a, a two-tier production systems with some producers being engaged in, in certification with many benefits and, and cost reduction and other farmers that are a bit, uh, that, that cannot get any, any benefit from, from that. So that's probably something that cannot be accepted by the Ministry of Agriculture of Cameroon. Uh, that's uh, this new background and pressures opens a new opportunity to think in the coming years about new form of, of governance and to think about what may be the functions that should be more efficiently uh, provided by the states and, and some of the functions that may be more efficiently provided by, by the private companies in framework of, of certification. So that's probably something we should uh, think about and, and observe in the coming years in Cameroon. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Guillaume, in absentee. I'm sure he hasn't got up at three o'clock in the morning in France to listen. Um, stop share. And now we're changing geographies again. Can you help? Uh, oh, you need another presentation. And we're now going to move to Brazil. Good morning. I am Marie Gabrielle Piketty, economist at CIRAD Bay Montpellier. I'm sorry I cannot be with you this week, but I have a lot of travel commitment and it was really not possible for me to attend to the Congress. Thanks to Andrew and Michael for organizing this side event and for their understanding. I will present here the result of a work we initiate in partnership with C4 in the framework of Priority 18 of the Forest Trees and Agroforestry Challenge Program. Priority that analyze in several countries public and private commitment to zero deforestation. This first result obtained in the Brazilian Amazon will be complete within the framework of the project. Terramaz, Amazon Territory, that started in 2020 and is financed by AFG, the French uh, Agency for Development. I will briefly present at the end some of its challenge. Sorry, we've got the same problem. <laughs> so, first the context. The persistence of deforestation and forest degradation in the Brazilian Amazon, particularly during the last 10 years, and this even if there has been several public and private governments initiatives aimed to promote sustainable development compatible with forest conservation and restoration in this region. Such initiatives are led by subnational jurisdiction, but also by other levels of governance, national, regional, international, value change, that those same national jurisdictions implement or not, that have impacts or not. Seminal jurisdiction is both a level uh, of governance where initiatives are added and implemented, but also a level of articulation between other levels of governance with greater or lesser success on the reduction of deforestation and forest degradation. They are also seen as a privileged scale to guarantee the compliance of commitment to zero deforestation, their associated outcome, and allow smallholders inclusion. However, although promising, some knowledge gaps remain regarding the way such jurisdictional approach at those same national levels are implemented and their outcomes. Now let's take a Look at deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. The first graph shows the evolution of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon as a whole, whose data are well known and often cited in academic and non academic publication. They show a very strong decrease between two 
2004 and 2012, followed by a persistence or even a tendency to increase after 2012. Now, Brazil is a federation, and the second graph shows data by state in the Brazilian Amazon. As you can see on the second graph, this trend of persistent increase concerns mainly the state of power in the eastern Brazilian Amazon. Now, each state is composed of municipalities with a local government, municipio in Portuguese. There are 144 municipalities in Para State. We assess two indicators for each municipality Para. The persistent deforestation extensions, that is the sum of absolute deforestation increments occurred between 2013 and 2018, and the persistent deforestation rate, which is the persistent extinction area divided by the total accumulated deforestation in the municipality. The second indicator is useful to assess in every municipality the weight of persistent deforestation in the whole deforestation process. We plot all the 144 municipalities of the state in a two-dimension scatter plot graphic, as you can see here, with persistent rate in abscess axis and persistent extension in the ordinate axis, and we identify six types. entering in detail about those data, this typology. What I wanted to show here is that municipality where deforestation persists are not numerous. 18 municipality only over 144. Most municipality have progressed indeed in the control of deforestation. Then choose two municipalities, one post-frontier, Pagominas municipality, and one with persistent deforestation, São Félix do Xingu, to analyze more closely what happened after 2008, when both municipalities were blacklisted by federal government because of their high deforestation rate. This period gave rise to the Green Municipality Program, led first by Pagominas and then external to all para municipality. Several conditions were set to exit the blacklist and its restriction, and amongst them, the need to reduce the annual deforestation rate below 40 square kilometers per year. As you can see on this graph, para succeed after 2012, but not San Felix du Xingu, even if there have also been several initiatives in this jurisdiction in this specific jurisdiction to halt deforestation. Led by Frédéric Brandau, who was working at C4 until last year, we performed a qualitative comparative analysis looking at the specific socioeconomic and biophysical features of each jurisdiction the different interventions aimed at halting deforestation, the way local actors implemented or developed their own intervention. We then used six indicators to compare our case study, the role of local government, vertical coordination, adaptive management, horizontal coordination, participation and inclusion, alignment of public and private initiatives. For such analysis, we had to collect a lot of academic and technical documents to detail the timelines of interventions, documents that have been completed by an analysis of 102 semi-structure interview. In this work, we have assumed that it was crucial to understand behind intervention, public or private, the specific features and process that can explain why some apparently similar initiative at the municipal level may not have the same expected outcome. Yeah. 
Looking at inter intervention, we show that both municipalities were impacted by several field-based interventions when they were added to the highest deforester, de deforester list, the list in 2008. This led the municipal government in Paragominas, with support from the main local actor and different NGO, to produce a roadmap to exit the list. More in both municipality, perception changed. Deforestation was no longer acceptable. The initial goal to exit the list was set by Paragominas and then applied to other municipalities through the Green Municipality Program. And this, independently of the size of the municipality. Whereas, for example, San Felix du Xingu four times larger than Paragominas. More, despite their efforts, none of the municipality benefited much from wet trust funding. Comparing the role of the local government, we found the local government engagement was strongly different between both municipalities, and San Felix was much more led by external actors than Paragominas at its early stages. More, Paragominas achieved a high level of coordination with the federal and state government, whereas articulation with those two levels was much more difficult in San Felix. The political setting in San Felix was also problematic since two of the last four elected mayors were charged with corruption and one environmental secretary was murdered during the same period. Articulation across government level was thus led by NGO that played indeed an important role here, even if some structural problems also linked to lack of operational capacity of some federal and state agency remained unresolved. As the process advanced in both municipalities, a difference in the local government leadership to also reflect in their ability to manage stakeholder expectation and take new steps. The pioneer status and political capacity of Paragominas enabled the local government to define the rules to get off the blacklist then the Green Municipality Initiative became obsolete and the municipality could define other targets such as developing a new integrated development plan or acquiring the verifying <coughs> source status. The process was much slower in San Felix. Despite effort, the municipality did not succeed in getting off the list and had difficulty to render new target operational. This led to pessimism as benefit and satisfaction from effort already made have been lacking. Both case studies show some effort to promote cross-sectoral policy alignment, but the process mainly focused on specific commodity and actors. With the presence of a lot of external actors, engagement and participation have been much broader since the beginning in San Felix and aim to achieve more effective results. However, too many consultation, platform meetings raised high hopes amongst participants, but that could not always be fulfilled, leading some time to demobilization. In Paragumina, it was also easier to reach target regarding deforestation threshold without very broad participation at the beginning, because most deforestation at that time was taking place in medium and large land holding. Finally, if there has been some initiative involving private commitment to remove commodity-driven deforestation from the supply chain, such as the soil moratorium and the cattle agreement, they did not translate into premium or strong positive market incentives. Concluding from those two examples regarding the capacity of municipalities in Brazil as a national jurisdiction called deforestation without exclusion first, the role of the local government and its legitimacy are crucial. 
when both are questioned, the civil society and other actors can make difference, but they cannot completely substitute such local government. Second, participation is important, but it must also be operational. Too many meetings, consultation without concrete results can be counterproductive. Organizing participation step by step, which concrete result, impartial, is as important. It can turn out counterproductive to impose the same target and the same level of deforestation reduction for all jurisdictional initiatives. It is thus important to adjust the objective to local reality and also to have a transparent monitoring system that demonstrates progress and gaps. Such system can indeed attract private investments that are truly committed to promoting sustainability. Now, uh, what we're going to do uh, regarding governance uh, in, in the Terramas project is to go further and uh, systematically identify public policies and the necessary coordination at different levels to guarantee the expected impact of jurisdictional approach at the subnational level aimed at sustainable agricultural development, forest conservation and restoration and social inclusion and to identify the complementarity and possible articulation of the public policies implemented with the different systems of certification proposed by or in this territory. And we are going to work in Guavia, Colombia, uh, Madre de Dios, Peru, Paragominas and Cotriguasu in Brazil. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Gabriel, in absentia. here. Now, we're, I'm trying to find uh, the last presentation. Can you help over there? I stop sharing. Yeah. Um, no, not that one. You're going to start sharing? No. Can you help? find the other presentation so i don't know what it is the uh, this one yeah okay is it on the share screen now this one this one this one and again we're changing we are can you do full screen Changing geographies again, and this time we're now moving to West Africa. And this particular case study is looking at the role of a national multi-stakeholder initiative, the Table Filière Carité, TFK, uh, and its role in terms of the inclusion of women shear producers in agribusiness and cosmetic value chains in Burkina Faso. Uh, just a quick outline. I'm not going to go through all that. I'll just go through it in the interest of trying to save some time. I want to start with a little bit of history, though. This is uh, from some archives from the Gold Coast colony in 1924, so almost 100 years ago, when a superintendent of agriculture and forestry, a Mr. Cool, made the following observation. The collecting of shear kernels is entirely done by women but anticipated this would alter when it was found out there was money to be made from shear kernels. And this is exactly what happened in the post 2005 era when global demand for what are called cocoa butter equivalents, which substitute for cocoa butter, led to a massive increase in the demand for shear kernels and shear butter. Just as a little bit of background, shear, for those of you who know, is Vitellaria uh, paradoxa. It's a member of the Sapotesi family. It occurs in a very broad band, I'll show them up later, and represents a gendered value chain for at least two centuries. If you use some of the old Arab uh, traveler, Muslim traveler texts, which have been translated now into English, it actually goes back more than six or 700 years. But the value chain has been restructured post 2000. And women shear producers are increasingly vulnerable. Nevertheless, shear remains a staple food oil for 200 million people and a critical source of revenues for 16 million women 
across three and a half million square kilometers of sub-Saharan Africa. And just to give you some idea of the extent, uh, this is based on a paper by uh, Peter Lovett and others, of the extent to which shear occurs across this whole belt, stretching from Senegal all the way through to Uganda. Although there are differences between the West and the East in terms of whether they're high or low steering content shear oil. Critical point to remember is that half of shear nut production is still consumed locally. It's an essential staple food oil. And our own research uh, from a former doctoral candidate, Karen Russo, who now works with the Agence Française de Développement, we found that 94% of households collect shear nuts and of whom 60% also sell shear nuts and or shear butter. It's mainly exported from seven countries in the West African sub-region and Burkina Faso and Ghana are the two most important. Current rolling average, something like 350 to 400,000 tons a year. The Global Shear Alliance confirmed last year in 2021 was the first year that total production exceeded half a million tons. There's been an evolution over time in terms of the shear nut price, but most critically, the value of exports tripled between 2000 and 2005 and increased sevenfold between 2005 and 2012. And this largely reflected the demand from BRICS countries for the cocoa butter equivalents, which are used in chocolate manufacture, but also in the confectionery industry. So again, it's important to remember that most of the exports, 90% is for the agribusiness, the agri-food business value chain, whereas only 10% is for the cosmetics value chain. This is a simplified diagram taken from the Global Shear Alliance strategic plan uh, of the shear value chain in terms of how from collectors all the way through to refiners and the end up uh, between this broad division between edible brands and the personal care brands um, of using this shear. In reality, it's a much more complex pyramidal purchasing network which exists in Burkina Faso, which links women shear collectors and sellers in periodic local markets, which occur every three to four days throughout the West African region. These link then with retailers and mid-level traders who then supply to wholesalers in Bobo which is the second largest town in the southwest of the country. And ultimately, this is to supply the big transnational corporations, of which the big four are Oros Olia Kalsham, which is the Danish-Swedish consortium, AAK, Bunge Lodis Grockland, which is an American, Malaysian, British uh, company, Fuji Oil, and then last but not least, 3FI, which is an Indian transnational corporation. In terms of the national multi-stakeholder initiative, I'm not going to go through all the detail. I just want to highlight some of the critical points. In the late colonial period, the first price stabilization fund was set up to try and control, i.e. a government control of the sheer uh, marketing in the country. That collapsed. They tried to set up another price stabilization fund in 1968. And then during the structural adjustment period in the early 1990s, that also collapsed. And we saw market liberalization of the sheer sector, and which was what triggered initially the development of national consultation framework which eventually led to the creation of the Table Filière, the Ducaite Association in 2000. This was formally nested within a global multi-stakeholder initiative, the Global Share Alliance, which is established in Ghana as a result of a USA-financed West African trade hub. And then in 2009, it was legally officially recognized as an association interprofessionnelle in French, and then was restructured in 2019 following new legislation, which required that the three separate chapters of the table de filière qualité, which relate to production, processing, and marketing, uh, were established in accordance with a new law. But what does the table de filière qualité aim to do? Essentially, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative which aims to assist and empower women shear producers in Burkina Faso through improved representation, liaison with government, the organization of production processing and marketing and trade in Chile, and access to information. It currently has 60 representatives, and it, but its role has changed over time as new national and international regulations have emerged. But it was 
critical in establishing the first sheer exchange, which was then replaced by what is now called the Salon International de Carité de Ouagadougou, which is held every two years. And they've introduced new charters of good governance of village tree enterprises. The sheer is essentially a non-timber forest product, which were introduced in 2018. In terms of its governance, it has a general assembly, a board, an executive committee, executive secretary, internal control commission, and then specialized commissions which are set up. Its critical weakness is that it has throughout its existence depended entirely on external funds from donors and NGOs, and very often has been characterized by conflicts in terms of leadership between particularly the members of the three chapters. This dependence on external donor finance projects and member contributions is its core weakness, it's, a, it's Achilles heel. This led to then discussions which started in 2019 uh, with the proposal to try and establish a three-tier, what's called in French, a contribution forfaitaire obligatoire, which is an obligatory contribution, in effect a tariff on whether shear is being exported as unprocessed shear kernels, or it's being exported as shear butter, or it's being uh, marketed locally. So this, these were the three different <coughs> values. But this has not been implemented yet because they had earlier problems with similar contribution for Fitera with the cashew and sesame value chains in the country. However, in terms of what are the options other than this CFO uh, opportunity to raise funding, I think there are five new roles which I just want to summarize. Uh, in terms of the ser services that could be provided by TFK and or uh, other partners that could support them. One critical one relates to the question of securing women's rights to land and trees. And despite multiple iterations of what is called the framework law, the reform agraire foncière, this has not led in Burkina Faso in, to either securing land rights or usufruct rights to trees. And this is critical in relation to the access to use of tree crops. And in that sense, it's essential to understand shear tree as an essential managed food tree crop. In effect, it falls between the agricultural sector and the forestry sector, and it doesn't fit neatly in either. And this has created huge uh, complications. I would argue we need disruptive change to redefine how women's rights to land and trees can be better secured, particularly in terms of uh, the changing social organization in rural communities and a country which has been hit by the growth in jihadist activity in West Africa. I have suggested that this could involve possibly piloting social and environmental performance based payments targeting women, such as getting children vaccinated and or school attendance and or the exclusion of fire on farms. These have been tested in Brazil, for those of you who know the Borussia Social Bolsonaro. My Portuguese is uh, appalling. Um, these, have, these have worked in other countries. Secondly, a critical gap is the regeneration of parklands. Despite 40 years of projects supporting women share producers, these are focused almost entirely on either improving the organization of women share producer groups. Secondly, the introduction of new technologies, particularly for the pressing of shear butter and the extraction of the shear nut oil. And thirdly, improving access to markets. What we found in recently published work that was published in the International Forest Review at the end of last year is that over that 40 year period, almost no interventions were actually looking at actually sustaining the resource base. So this has become now one of a 10 point action plan that was adopted during a jointly C4 government of Burkina Faso hosted national forum on Shear that was held in July last year. So it is possible to propagate. But then much, much more emphasis needs to be placed on the regeneration of the. Thirdly, there is a need to improve women's access to affordable finance. And here, Himalayan is in the room. I'm suggesting we might need to look at developing at a national and or regional scale, the use of an innovative regional financing instrument, such as a blended finance instrument in conjunction with public finance for some of the pilot operations. I won't go into the details here because again, we're running out of time. Fourthly, there is a huge need and opportunity to improve access to new African markets. Traditionally, shear has been marketed either in North America or in Europe. But the creation of the new African continental free trade area creates a huge new market. 
But information about that is still relatively scarce, particularly for women share producers. Particularly the need to try and improve access to information about the progressive removal of tariffs on shear products, which vary between 10 to 40 percent, depending on which country, to enhance readiness for trade in the African continental free trade area. And last but not least, there's much greater recognition and communication of the multiple benefits of agroforestry partners, which is needed. As I pointed out, it's a critical crop for 200 million people. But it's one of a number of threatened agroforestry species in the parklands. So it's important to look at the parklands as a whole and the multiple goods they provide for use by humans and livestock, as well as the ecosystem services, soil fertility, shade, biodiversity, pollination services, protection of catchments, climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as continuing to provide a critical source of edible oil for subsistence use and revenues, particularly for women. So there's some additional reading for those who are inter interested, um, but thank you. I'll stop here. Now, we've, if, you're, if you are willing to stay, we will, of course, welcome any further questions. And then there are just some concluding remarks after we've listened to some of your questions. Can you put up one, the, the, another, go back to the So any questions, Michael, do you want to hear? Um, don't see any in the uh, we had there were two in the Q&A, uh, which I answered uh, in writing and these related to uh, questions on the um, the FSC smallholder standard and why it focused only on plantations. My response was that uh, in the four countries that the standard was developed for uh, initially. Um, natural forest, yeah. small holding to go down. For natural forestry is, is extremely limited. It was also viewed yeah. that uh, plantation forestry was a, a, an easier first okay. step in Keep developing a, a small holder standard. Keep going. Keep going. Um, right. So at, at yeah. some yeah. point, if the standard yeah. expands and is like used that. elsewhere, where there is small holder natural forestry, you find that then it would, be, it would be adapted uh, for those conditions. No. Uh, another question was on the, uh, there is another uh, smallholder um, standard in FSC, the SLIMF, um, and I was asked why, uh, why a, a second smallholder standard is needed, and the second smallholder no, standard is for 20 hectares or less of small holdings, whereas SLIMF is, is uh, 100 hectares, where you have a small business business and activities. So those were the two questions online. If there's any any other questions? Yeah, uh, gentleman in the front, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's the old one. That's Just your, your name and uh, affiliation. Yes. Uh, yeah, my name is Thomas. I work for the European uh, Forest Institute. Um, yeah, I have. I sorry, I missed the very first part of your presentation. So apologies if you have already touched upon this point. Um, yeah, but a problem I think with uh, certification in the context of uh, smallholders is that uh, that I mean, with external support, smallholders can get to the level of being certified, but they cannot keep it, uh, especially if such support is no longer available. So I was wondering if you know how FSC is addressing this issue and also what kind of support is actually available to uh, help smallholders to achieve uh, certification status. Thank you. Thanks, a great question. And I guess to, to some degree, your question is uh, exactly addressed why uh, FSC decided to develop a, a, an additional smallholder standard, the, the one that I, I've been involved with. Um, and, and, and as I explained, the, the new standard uh, is much, much more simplified uh, where the smallholder, you know, the intention was that the smallholder uh, should be capable of meeting the certification standard requirements uh, by, by themselves uh, or with, with, uh, with, with support from other smallholders. Uh, but, the, but yeah, that was the intention was that they didn't need to hire consultants to uh, to do major, um, you know, high conservation value assessments and, and environmental impact assessments. Um, and then the, the one issue we didn't address 
is the annual auditing costs by the um, this, this certifying body, um, and that, and, that, and that's that's still something to be uh, you know the costs for that annual auditing, obviously, uh, because the audit is looking at a, a much more simple standard. Uh, the, the the assumption is that the auditing costs should be quite a bit less as well. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that, that answers your question. Uh, yes. Mattia Lipper from Tunin Institute of Forest, Free Hamburg, Germany. I also missed the first part, but I, I like it very much, your presentation. Um, my question go to the certification associated with, uh, for example, EU timber regulation or this upcoming deforestation fee uh, commitment. We learned from the EU TR that the certification is not automatically verified as a green lane for, for the certified timber to immediately export to the EU country, right? So that actually require the importer to have to exercise due diligence when they ex import some timber or timber product. And that put a lot of pressure to the producing country, especially to the small holder. With the new commitment on the deforestation fee value chain, it will be the same thing. Do you think there would be an approach or something about this challenge that can support the small holder, those who also have to comply with the certification, but also have to you know, pursue in the same direction of this kind of regulation. Okay. Well, th thank you for that. Uh, yeah, you're, you're referring to essentially two different issues, one being legality certification, uh, which is essentially a applicable to, I believe, uh, about seven countries, uh, Indonesia being, I guess, the first to achieve uh, FLEC VPA, um, and the the uh, TLAS, the uh, Indonesia, the uh, SVLK, uh, SVLK, uh, the uh, legality certification or certificate. Uh, that process is reasonably well streamlined. Um, in you know, for example, in Indonesia, where it's the first one, uh, uh, their SVLK certificates are are required by all. Uh, uh, both forestry and, and wood product uh, uh, enterprise, whereas the, the FSC certification is, is a sustainability certification. Um, uh, so they're really two different systems. I, uh, I, I'm, I think if you can achieve the FSC certification for smallholders, then you would almost automatically uh, also fulfill the requirements of the legality certification under uh, you know principle one in FSC uh, deals with with legality. So uh, there would probably be separate processing, you know certification processing costs that the smallholder would have to absorb. Uh, that would be you know that's an issue I don't believe has been has been resolved yet. I think I'm going to seize your question as an opportunity to segue into the, the, the concluding remarks because they actually end up on the second slide with reference to the EU's uh, new proposed regulation. Um, so if you permit me, then we can um, bring this so you can all get on and get your coffees or whatever you next want to move on to. And in terms of what we've learned looking at uh, this vast array of different instruments and sustainability standards and the private uh, governance arrangements have been introduced, and increasingly now the hybrid governance arrangements which are emerging, we see that the growing complexity and multiplicity of governance initiatives does not necessarily equate with greater effectiveness in terms of actions on the ground or even reduced rates of deforestation and forest degradation. I alluded to in the uh, introductory remarks to the Forest 500 report, which suggested that there isn't a single company which has attained any of the targets that they'd originally set for 2020. There are key questions about combating imported deforestation. To what extent, as you heard from the case from both Cameroon and uh, Brazil, to what extent will states, will the governments take the lead in the development of either incentives and or binding instruments? 
I think what we've learned from many certification schemes is that they in themselves are not enough. Yes, but we also recognize there is a need to better understand and manage the ambiguities and the trade-offs during implementation of many of these new complex hybrid policy regimes. I don't know if I can move on to the next slide or where that's been controlled. This one here. Where is it? Does that, Does that not work? It's not working. Can you get me onto the next slide? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's one computer doesn't. Thank you. Yeah, it's, there's, there's one computer doesn't speak to the other. In addition, as I think Marie Gabriel recognized in her presentation, we need to really develop a much better understanding of the outcomes of jurisdictional approaches and how to monitor their progress. But lastly, and this ties in with your question, very much related to um, uh, whether you know, certification or, uh, provides a green lane or not, I just wanted to highlight uh, three or four recent initiatives. Uh, one of which is the Forest Positive Alliance led by the Consumer Goods uh, Forum. In addition, you may have seen that there's been an initiative to try and develop a more standard uh, reporting system led by the Accountability Framework Initiative and what used to be called the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, for 2020, which companies are increasingly trying to use and adopt. In addition, there was an innovative finance for critical uh, agri-SMEs by the Global Ag Alliance. But most importantly, I think, in terms of the future, this EU's proposal to, to introduce a new regulation on deforestation-free products, because this isn't just about timber anymore. That proposal relates to another five commodities and some derived products, including chocolate products. So this is where even the, the shear butter becomes relevant uh, as well in these debates. But this is still being negotiated. There are lots of issues. My own personal view is I think there are huge challenges ahead, uh, even in terms of what we've learned in terms of the implementation of Flag T of EPA. Michael alluded to seven countries. In reality, there is only one country currently, only one country which has actually developed an operational uh, system, and that is Indonesia. All other countries are still in the process of trying to finalize their uh, legality systems, but haven't yet developed uh, licensing uh, in the other countries. Now, if we extrapolate the experience from that Flag T VPA experience and the difficulties even the member states in Europe have faced in terms of how, how do these countries control this, and now extrapolate that to another five commodities in terms of a more legality based, I think we have a, a long and winding road ahead, to put it mildly. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much for participating and our apologies for the technical glitches, but I hope we got there in the end. Thank you. Thanks.